Hey, Sean. How are you? Good, John. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing well. Uh, I'm John Lamasny. For those of you who don't don't know, and this is Sean Petrowski. Hello. And, uh, we are here to talk to you about the customer and the service, which is a, a weekly podcast now. Thank you, Sean, about uh, customer service, the way that it's performed. Uh, hopefully, some case studies to talk about how to perform it well, and. Um, Let's talk a little bit about ourselves, Sean. Who are you? Uh, I'm a technologist that's worked in higher education for the past uh, 12, uh, 11 years. I'm also an adjunct professor in the Computer Information Systems Department at Ryder University. I uh, also like to make short films. I'm a, I've been a blogger for as long as I can remember. I'm into video games, and I'm very passionate about good customer service. And I'm John Lamasny. I'm, uh, I sort of have a, a list that I usually do. I'm a designer, an artist, I'm an advocate for open source software. Uh, I have been working in instructional technology in higher education for the last 14 years. Wow, 14 years. And uh, I really love good customer service too, and we're here to celebrate it tonight. So what do we got tonight, Sean? Uh... We have uh, we got three topics tonight: uh, customer service, interpersonal relationships, library technology assessment with focus on patrons, and organizations supporting platforms only embraced by their customers, not the organization itself. Uh, but before we get into that, I think it's uh, important. Is, tonight's a really important night for us, actually. It sure is. We've been doing this. This is our fifth week doing the show. As John mentioned before, we are now available in podcast form. Uh, you can find us on uh, iTunes, Zoom Marketplace, and we have a feed that's compatible with many popular Android um, uh, podcast readers. And you can find out more information about our podcast by going to our website, which is uh, officially at tcats.seanpetrowski.net. Uh, the link is on the screen right now. If you're listening to the podcast, you don't need that website, so don't worry about it. Uh, but that's got links to all of our podcast sources, uh, and it's also an easy way for you to just manually subscribe to our podcast without having to use a smartphone or any other ecosystem that maybe is not supported. So uh, be sure to check us out there. And I just wanted to say thank you to Sean for all the work and uh, footwork specifically uh, related to the podcast because I think that it's a great way for people to be able to take our content with them. Absolutely, and I think uh, you know that's one com one not a complaint, but feedback I've gotten a lot is that you know people have said that they think the show is excellent, uh, but it's not always easy for them to sit down and watch it at a computer, and so now they can take it with them wherever they go, listen on the train while they walk, whatever, and I think that's uh, going to make things really awesome for everybody. Fantastic, and I always like to review what we're talking about, so I'm definitely going to subscribe myself. Great, and so uh, why don't we get going? Fantastic. So, uh, as Sean said, our first topic, let me just bring it up here for myself, um, customer service and interpersonal relations. So, um, we, we talked about this a little bit in past uh, episodes, and the, the thing is that customer service and really organizational leadership and organizational theory, in my opinion, can be applied to your personal life. And uh, what do I mean by that? So, some people have never really considered, for example, what their strategic plan is, their personal strategic plan. And uh, there is a strategic planning process. For those of you who have never had an organizational leadership class or uh, business classes that deal with organizational theory, a strategic plan is sometimes seven steps, sometimes nine steps. It, it involves things like feedback and involves usually a SWOT analysis, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. And you can see how, as an individual, as, a, as an individual person, if you look around you and see what your strengths are, or if you look around you and see what your weaknesses or opportunities or threats are, you might be able to guide yourself a little bit better towards the goals that you have, the same way an organization might. Uh, so take that concept aside. I think we'll maybe talk about that more in some future episode. But... Uh, so in interpersonal relations, you know, like my friendship with Sean, there is customer service, even though we are not customer and um, server to each other. 
the there is a certain expectation though in an interpersonal relationship that you, there there's a, a gift and a receipt right you, you are giving something and receiving something and if you're not doing that chances are in the same way that I walked out of Qdoba the other day because that woman was behind the counter and there was nobody else behind the counter and I really missed out on my delicious burrito because of her <laughs> uh, Sean might not get what he needs out of his relationship with me as a friend. And the minute that that happens, he's going to have to reconsider our past history. And he may, might say, I'm just not getting out of this effort what I need. You know, and, and it can be in family. It can be in work relationships. It can be in any dyadic relationship, any relationship between two people. Or it might even be you and your family. In other words, you and a group that is not a business group, but rather an interpersonal group, uh, and they are expecting a certain level of service from you. Sometimes it's it's legitimate service, like the chores that you have to do in your house. Sometimes it's just the ability to uh, maintain that relationship in a positive way. And so I guess I wanted to talk with Sean a little bit and, and by proxy talk with you about the idea of customer service in interpersonal relationships. What do you think, Sean? Well, a friend taking, 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 and I needed to reassess. Uh, so I've been down that road before and, uh, you know, never really thought of it, uh, you know, friendship as a customer service relationship until this evening. And the, you know, the more that I think about the, the, the friendships that I have that have lasted a long period of time, um, that's an equal give and take. And it always has been. And, you know, uh, as we get older, you know, in our lives, it's, it's difficult to maintain friendships as well uh, as we did when we were younger. And I think our uh, expectations and of what a friendship uh, it really is defined, the definition of a friendship as we get older, uh, changes. And so, therefore, you know, just like in, in the real world, when it comes to, you know, customer service from a service organization or a retail outlet, you know, uh, as, as time changes, you know, so do trends and customer service in the marketplace. So I think that's, uh, you know, an excellent analogy. You know, I, I never really thought about how one-to-one -one friendship and customer relations in a marketplace are, and they really are almost the same thing. And it's so fun. Hey, Sean, how are you? Hello, John. So, uh, sorry about that little interruption there. Uh, this is this is a new form of broadcasting, right? This is uh, broadcasting out of your living room, so we're, we're occasionally going to run into problems with our connectivity. At any rate, uh, what I was saying was I think that it's really interesting that uh, in your feedback about this idea, you were talking about how your relationships change over time and there's a little bit more distance usually as you get older and you get more involved in work and more involved in your uh, main personal relationship usually with your significant other and one of the ways that I maintain and I know that you maintain your interpersonal relationships even though you might not see those people as much is Facebook right or in your case Twitter or whatever the case might be but using social networks is a way to sort of extend customer service for businesses, right? If businesses are doing it right, they're using social networks as a way to um, connect with their customers and, and stay connected with them even when they're not in the store or not interacting with them directly. And the same is true for interpersonal relationships by uh, taking the network and making it a platform for staying connected by continuing to have conversations and for providing services that people expect in interpersonal relationships. You can use Facebook in order to 
provide interpersonal customer service. So do you agree, disagree? You think that it's an effective way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we talked about that last week about, uh, or maybe it was the week before, where we talked about how social media, specifically Twitter, and a little bit about Facebook, about how they uh, customers to interface with organizations. So absolutely, totally in agreement with that thought. Yeah, and I mean, the, the thing about it, too, is that sometimes customer service, interpersonally speaking, takes, takes part, takes... Uh, you had just listened to a block of whatever, and I thought that was really cool, and we had a little conversation about it. And then probably after the fact, I saw you on the street and said, I really love that song. And it's, it's like that kind of extension that allows us to keep a strong interpersonal relationship even though we might not see each other every day, and we don't. And I feel like we have a really strong relationship, and it's, it's sort of evidence of social networking as extending uh, not only interpersonal relationships, but also customer service, potentially. Uh, you know, as, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about, in my head, I'm thinking about the highest levels of customer service. And I'm talking about customer service that people like you and I have not experienced. Uh, and in a, a specific example, uh, personal shoppers. Okay? Now, you think about it. You know, the, 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 our highest income earners benefit from personal shoppers or they work with an organization maybe like a Barney's, a Neiman Marcus that offer personalized shopping experiences. Now I say that they're examples of the highest level of customer service because these organizations for their highest paying customers take time to learn about their customers. Learn their you know fashion choices, what trends are they following. You know they really take a time to build a profile and the more information that, that a Neiman Marcus or Barney's has about their, their clients, the better that relationship is going to be. Just okay. like, as you said, you know, the more information you have about me, the better our interpersonal relationship is going to be. And, you know, so that, that you've really touched upon something that I think businesses uh, that are outside of that higher service sphere can tap into. So if you actively follow your social media connections with your customers, your, their, their Twitter feeds, their Facebook profiles, you're seeing the things that they like, the things that they comment on, you know, the people that they interact with. You can kind of, if you really care and you really want to know and get to service your customers at a highest level, then by following them in those arenas, you'll be able to build a dossier or a profile, whatever you want to call it, on your customer and provide tremendous service to them, just as I am able to provide you tremendous friendship by following your activity on Spotify, you know, your photos on Flickr, etc. Right. And it, it, it really is a choice. I mean, it's, it's me putting something out there in order to be, um, to be somebody who shares doesn't necessarily mean that there's a connection. It doesn't mean that somebody else is paying attention. It's only when they pay attention and feedback or like you know, the like is, one of the beauties of the like button is how easy it is to do. You know, plus one does the same thing, but not quite. It's, there, there is a certain connotation to like that people really get behind. And uh, retweeting the same thing, except retweeting has the original content as part of that share. And so there's, there's sort of more depth to it. There's more of a reinforcement of the idea that not only do you like it, but you're willing to say it on somebody else's behalf to the people who follow you. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a certain quality to that that's, that's very, very nice, certain connotation that's enjoyable. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the, I like that you're, you know, because I'm glad that you pointed out the distinction between the plus one and the like, because maybe I'm wrong about this, but the way that I view a plus one is very different from a like. I've, I view a plus one almost like a plus one on dig. Yeah. Remember dig? You would you would you would plus one something, and I know uh, Reddit works the same way. Yeah. And it moves it up in the list, and the more points, the higher the list it goes. And while there's no actual list on Google Plus, if you see a post that has a lot of plus ones, then you know that a lot of people are liking it. It's more likely to show up in your feed, even if it's not in your circle. But a like. You know, a like has a different connotation. A like is is almost, to me, the way I look at it is, is like an endorsement. 
You know, like Chris Christie and, uh, endorsed Mitt Romney at the beginning of the, the uh, Republican uh, primaries. He might as well just liked him on Facebook. You know what I mean? Like that would be the modern way of announcing endorsements, you know? Right. And uh, I think that's, uh, you know, a very powerful, you know, uh, difference that I agree. pointed out. I agree. And, and there are subtle differences. There's, there's certainly a more geeky connotation to the plus one. It's, it sort of comes from an extension of, of geek culture. Um, like, you know, saying something plus plus, in other words, adding one to something in programming, is a lot different than saying, hey, that was pretty damn good, you know? Right. So it, there's a more casual feel to uh, Facebook like than there ever is to a plus one. And I think that those distinctions are fine, but I think that they attract different audiences. And that's part of the reason why Google Plus has this. Um, I guess we'll call it an adoption issue, where you know uh, they're not necessarily trying to be Facebook, but they they're not going to be either. You know, <laughs> they, they probably wouldn't mind if they were. Right. Uh, but they're it's it's not likely to happen, and it's because it's got a different, more utilitarian feel to the way that they're doing things. So I thought we might move on to our next topic and uh, maybe, or at the very least, blend the, the two topics for right now. Okay. Uh, library technology assessment with a focus on patrons. So uh, I recently had the great benefit. I've done a lot of work with libraries, and um, specifically in New Jersey. I have a, a lot of friends in libraries in New Jersey and have done most of my consulting work in association with New Jersey libraries talk a lot about design, talk a lot about technology, and uh, talk a lot about specific applications that can be useful for not only librarians, very often librarians, but also patrons. So I had a unique opportunity in a New Jersey library in South Jersey to uh, sit down with the director and the main technologist at that library. They're at a point where they're sort of restarting the library. They're, they're not starting over per se, but their infrastructure, their technology infrastructure, their uh, phones, their video, uh, their community room, all those things are sorely lacking what we would expect in any modern library. Uh, if I was a presenter and I wanted to present at that library to a community group, let's say that um, I wanted to start a Linux users group uh, much like we have in Princeton uh, at this library. The first problem is that the connectivity is so bad that um, it wouldn't be reliable for 30 people to sit in, in the room and all be connected at once. It's, it's a shared connection and it's just not of high bandwidth and it's set up in such a way that it's not very practical for uh, patrons to use. Also, uh, there's no projection system in that room. No projection system in the library. And uh, this particular library has three phone lines for like 14 people to share. So there's no, yeah, it, it was amazing. And it really shows that this library hasn't been paid attention to by the township that it's in. And it hasn't really been... Um, hasn't been shown the love that it needs to be shown in order to show its patrons that love too. You can, you can just tell. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, in their plan moving forward for how to use technology, some of the conversations that we've had uh, were really focused about things like costs and practicality and uh, what's possible. Right, But really, I think that the conversation, and, and this was the conversation we ended up having, the conversation really needed to be more about who the patrons were, what they expected, and what they would do if they didn't get it from that library. And that's customer service. I mean, and libraries are all about customer service. And some of the best ones in the world we happen to be blessed with in this area. If, if, I don't know if you've ever been to Princeton Public Library. I have. It's uh, probably the only library I've been to in the last, well, that's not true, but it's the only public library I've been to in probably uh, 15 years. 
15 to 16 years. And uh, I happen to work in a library at Princeton. And I, I'm not a librarian, and I don't actually work in that side of the building. But the building itself is a library, and it's a beautiful library. And uh, like I said, we're, we're sort of blessed with these high technology, wireless everywhere, ubiquitous connectivity, comfortable spaces, places that you would want to be in your house if you could. And uh, it's quiet where it needs to be quiet, and it's active where it needs to be active. It's a great meeting space. It's a great thinking space. It's a great working space. And that's what a library is becoming, more so than a collection of books. Libraries that are focused on their book collections are going to die. I'm, I'm just going to say it, and I think that most of my librarian friends would agree that, yes, books still exist and books are still on the shelves, but if you're not thinking about e-books, if you're not thinking about DVDs, if you're not thinking about Redbox, if you're not thinking about Netflix, if you're not thinking about TiVo, if you're not thinking about... Uh, the programming, the, the literal programming that happens in the community room, if you are not engaging patrons to talk about the topics that they want to talk about, not necessarily offering them a book, but in addition to offering them a book, offering them video, offering them audio, offering them experience, offering them a comfortable space where they can have really great coffee and maybe some delicious, beautiful snack to eat and get together with friends and have a beautiful space to meet. That's what a library needs to become. If, if, if you are part of a library and you're not having that experience, you should either expect that or you should expect that library to go away. Because if it's not providing that, it's, it's probably not going to meet your needs as a patron. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. In your mind, what is the difference between a library, as you've just described it, and a community center? There is not much, a, but a community center is often worse off than a library. A community center, as, as you and I grew up and got to know it, was very often four walls and uh, somebody guarding, you know, all the valuables. So, uh, whereas a library is a, a place for storing and sharing media, a place where uh, performances happen, a place where people come together to watch a community event or watch a sporting event as a group. Uh, people, I'm sure, at Princeton Public, I, I didn't actually see it advertised, but I'm positive that the debates were shown in the community room for people to come and talk about it as a community. Because in Princeton Public, for example, politics is um, an important topic for that community. It also, I think, has to be community-centric. It, it really does need to be not only a community uh, meeting space, but a, a community living room. And I'm using that phrase as though it's mine, but it actually belongs to uh, the director of the Princeton Public Library. When she spoke at TEDx in one of our TEDx events there, TEDx being a perfect example of how Princeton Public Library is really running with the idea of bringing a community around ideas. Uh, when she spoke there, she focused on this idea of hers as the new library being the community living room. And you can think about, you know, what it's like in your community, in your living room, and how comfortable it is, and how it has all of your media just the way that you want it, and it has the opportunity to see things that you uh, want to see, and exclude things that you don't care to see. It's yours. And a community should feel that way about a library, and they should be able to go there, lounge, eat, converse, commute, and be a part of something that is not possible in their own living room. So am I, am I turning you on to the idea of uh, going to a library? Well, you know, as I've said leading up to this episode, I'm, I'm fairly anti-library. And, you know, I, I, I think my feelings of anti-library come from the point you made about libraries that are focused on books are already dead. And that is where a lot of my hatred for library stems from, in the sense that I feel as though the library that you and I grew up with is an artifact. It is an ancient relic, uh, and my, my experience in academia 
the Princeton Library, the Princeton University Library System is a unique gem, unlike any other system in the world. There are probably a few other, I would say Oxford probably is very close, uh, if not identical. Harvard maybe, I'm stretching there, I'm not sure, but Princeton and uh, Oxford. Let's just say Harvard's a great library. Okay, I will. All right, do, do that. Go so, ahead and say it, John. Say it loud, say it proud. I think those those libraries are, are they serve a very specific purpose, and they serve a purpose that I actually will f fully support. I feel as though a library is a necessary part of a university experience, whether it's a research institution or not, you know, like a university like Ryder, which is not a research institution by any means. Uh, it's a teaching school. And, you know, the community library, like we said, the one that we grew up with, it's dead. It doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, there are still uh, parts of this nation that that's the, the library that their town has or their community has. It's the it, may, old... it may be the closest thing they have to a cultural center. That's true. And uh, so, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it may be dead, but it, it, can't, it can't be dead because culture dies with it. It's like Latin. Latin, it's dead, but we still, we still teach it. And, you know, I struggle. I struggle every day. You know, we're, we're in a very, uh, we're running into very serious economic times, you know. And, you know, I know uh, there were budget cuts here in the state of New Jersey. Um, you know, funding for libraries was cut. I know in Trenton, actually, uh, major problems in Trenton, uh, Trenton budget issues forced the libraries to be closed and under the uh, leadership of Mayor Mack in Trenton, he rebranded re them, <laughs> rebranded them learning centers. Learning centers. Because there was, a legal, centers. there was a legal reason why they could not reopen them as libraries, uh, which is a topic not really necessary for this show. But the point that I'm trying to make is that I totally understand you know, how important it is for the community to have a central location. I just, and you know, to, to gather, to, to participate in events and, uh, you know, to, to engage in dialogue or, you know, like you said, relax, you know, like the, the community living room, you know, that is a, a phrase that I think is a really great de uh, description of what libraries are becoming. I, you know, like I said, that's something I, I totally subscribe to, but at the same time, it's just, uh, when I think of your love of libraries and how you just describe them. I think back to, and maybe this is just a semantics game, and maybe this is my problem with libraries is that I don't want them to be called libraries anymore, and I have a real problem with that. I just, I view them, uh, everything that you just talked up about being wonderful for a library, as a, a, that should be the role of a community center. And the word library and community center to me are very two different are two different things. It's it's possible that they can converge. It, it's possible that they that they become synonymous because as as libraries and the idea of libraries change, a uh, community center becomes more of in, in keeping with what a library is, and libraries become more in keeping with what a community center is. I think the reason that libraries would probably choose to retain the name libraries is because there is a concept that librarians, uh, people who, who study the science of libraries, uh, attend to, and uh, that is librarianship. It's the idea of helping people to gain knowledge in the same way that a teacher does, but without the same thresholds that, um, let's say, Princeton University does, and, and, and uh, any university. Not I'm not picking on Princeton, it's just, you know, uh, this this idea, though, that we are lowering the barrier of learning by doing things like participating in Coursera, right? The Coursera project allows people to attend classes, uh, be assessed, learn in the same way that they would if they were in classes, in physical classes, remotely from Spain, from Portugal, from uh, Africa, from Alaska, from everywhere. And taking part in a in a global community online, um, it starts to blur the lines of what academia is 
in the same way that the library starts to reinforce the lines of what community means. Right, so the, there is this, all, everything's changing, and th this is not a new idea, everything's been changing for a while, but as technology grows and as older technologies or more traditional technologies become uh, less important and uh, the technology catches up with our expectation for the ease of use of opening a book and being able to see text and pictures and video or whatever, I mean, you, that, that's the thing. We, we can't yet <laughs> and never probably will be able to open up a paper-based book and see video. It might look a lot like a paper-based book, and it might contain our entire library of books, our personal library. But um, technology changes the way that we interact with media, and libraries are, by default, need to be about media, not just books, but media in toto, right? So, you know, mobile technologies and computers and smart boards and uh, those things begin to come together with uh, community-based learning opportunities and non-academic, non-accredited uh, learning opportunities. You can think of it as also potentially taking over some of the value of um, continuing education classes, right? If, if you can go to the local library and learn about how to do programming, which you can do in the case of Princeton Public, why would you be paying to go do the same thing at a tech school at night? That's a good point too, but you know, as you're as you're just speaking that idea, you got my gears going and I feel like I'm I'm able to articulate my my stance a little bit better. And I and I think what what the way I view the current library, I think it's excellent that they've re, they're trying to reinvent themselves. They are reinventing themselves in, in a lot of communities. Princeton Public Library is a perfect example of a library that has reinvented itself into this, like I said, the community living room. But I feel as though that they're postponing the inevitable. And and what I mean by that is is that with the proliferation of mobile devices, as the cost of those devices comes down, <coughs> excuse me. Broadband internet becoming uh, more widespread throughout our nation. Uh, bandwidth, you know, increasing. You know, as we know, our, our bandwidth speeds are increasing uh, at exponential rates year by year. Such as with the Kansas project with Google. Exactly, Google Fiber, perfect example of that. That all of these reasons that that people are going to libraries today, like you said, continuing education programs. Uh, you know, tr training opportunities, uh, you know, film programs, you know, coming together, watching a film, discussing it, or interfacing with media in, in, in personal ways, whether that's through an e-reader or, you know, uh, renting a video and watching it. I feel as though the, the mobile device will, 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 will take out the need for people to travel to a library. And I think that libraries will exist in a virtual space in the sense that the trend that we're seeing right now in continuing education and undergraduate education right now, online education is very popular. And I don't think online education in continuing ed or undergraduate has crossed that technology threshold. I think it's still very text-based. Maybe there's some real-time chat going on. But I would say if we were to poll all the online institutions and, and ask them who's using audio, uh, you know, broadcasts or video broadcasts live or recorded, that that number is very small. And I see the library as probably being a space to, to break that barrier before continue, you know, these online universities. And I think, and, and here's, and this is what I foresee that why that, why that's the case, because you might say, well, Sean, you know, these University of Phoenix or, or Drexel, they, they have a 15-year, 20-year head start on online education compared to a library. But as we look, like I said, we have budget cuts. You just talked about a library in, in South Jersey that's been neglected probably for budgetary reasons and no other reason than that. You know, money was not an option. You know, uh, if it's in South Jersey, depending on how deep it is, it could be a shore community. You know, there's not enough tax revenue year-round. In this particular case, sadly, that was not the case. They had 
uh, plenty of money. They they just didn't have, I think, the right direction or consultation. Okay. So that that problem's being solved, and and it's likely that the money will go to the right place, and that they will have a cultural center, they will have a community living room, and they will have um, a place to gather and to uh, break bread, converse about things, and and learn something together. Okay, so let me let me use Trenton then as our example. So a city like Trenton, like I said, the, the mayor has reopened the libraries as learning centers. For uh, you know, this is an issue I follow very closely in our local papers, and it, it sounds as though these learning centers are not fulfilling on the promises of the original library, or even as Mayor Mack's own definition of what the learning centers were supposed to do. They're understaffed. They don't have enough resources. The list goes on and on. And I would imagine that. There are probably hundreds of other examples throughout this nation that may not be as bad as the Trenton example, but are pretty darn close. And so what I foresee is, is that with the money, that the overhead that's required to run a library, you could almost take that money and harness it into an online digital collection with video conferencing capabilities, digital storage for film, ebooks, etc. And it would almost... You know, and like I said, as the price of mobile devices comes down, you know, you, in the, in the future, I'm envisioning, which I think is is probably we, if you and I had the money, we could do it tomorrow. So I'm going to blow your mind right now. Okay, you're what not going to let me finish. What probably what you're talking about exists. Wow. Okay. Well, awesome. So let's hear uh, about it. Li <laughs> libraries are very often incorporating. Uh, centralized, further centralized uh, digital repositories as ways to, for example, distribute their ebooks. So no, I know this. This is what I know. Yeah, but I'm talking about, I'm, I'm taking it a step further, John. Okay. Tell In me. the sense that I think what we're doing right now is an example of the, a library of the future. In the sense that there would be, a, I don't, I, I don't want to say a website, but we'll say an online presence. And that could be defined, whatever that is in the future, where, where patrons interface with that online presence of the library. Are they not actual patrons? Well, no, because they're not physically visiting a library. So okay, they're you know they're customers, and so what's going on is is that with their cheap mobile device. I mean, I don't know about you, but I just got an Android device on a USB stick the other uh, a couple months ago. Cost me sixty bucks. I can plug it into my TV. It's got Wi-Fi, and I can surf the internet and download Android apps. There it is. Boom. Same guy, and it cost me sixty dollars. So if you want to get down to it, people can get on the internet with a with a mobile device for sixty bucks that'll work with their existing television, and they can use that to participate in online conversations like we're having. Because you know, right now. You can participate in a Hangout on uh, your mobile phone, right, if you have an Android phone. I sure could. So, so what's to stop a library from getting away from the brick-and-mortar operation, establishing a very serious online presence, conducting the same programming that they're conducting now virtually, which I think almost is better because you could open it up to a broader audience, and have people participating throughout the whole world and not be constrained by physical location or traveling logistics, and then also offer up the traditional media through this online presence, like they're doing already with ebooks, video, etc. So, uh, to me, any library that's, that's trying to reinvent itself as a community space or, like I, as I define it, a community center is prolonging the inevitable. And I almost feel like they need to for, they need to embrace the digital space faster and harder if they want to uh, stay relevant in the community's eyes. So I I hear exactly what you're saying. I I stand by the idea that this exists. What what you're describing essentially is something um, that has happened much with the approach of Chris Christie in New Jersey, for example. I'm very familiar with the, with the plight of libraries in New Jersey uh, budgetarily. And one of the things that happened was my consulting business before uh, the budget cuts in New Jersey was very different. 
uh, because I would travel all over the state and I would go to libraries for day-long presentations and talk about graphic design and I'd be able to stand with uh, librarians and patrons and be able to stand over their shoulder and, and have an interaction uh, connect and they had librarians from all over the state over a hundred people in the in the room and we had the same conversation that we would have had if I had stood in front of them except we didn't have to spend all that money on gas and all those things so what what you're to go to their centralized location for uh, continuing education credits or something like that um, it's very seldom that I get the opportunity to go and stand in front of an audience and have that kind of interaction again. I can tell you that comparing the two experiences that I still prefer, I understand why the Library Link New Jersey has to exist and why we do webinars as opposed to doing in-person sessions because of all the benefits that we just talked about. However, at Princeton Public, I go and I talk topics in front of people in their technology learning space and the reason that I do that is because it is a different kind of interaction. I am the first one that will support and tell about the benefits of uh, distance learning education opportunities. In my own education, I had the opportunity to do both in-class learning and distance learning. Sometimes the distance learning was a better experience, more rich, more opportunities for me to expose my thinking through writing. And I had both good and bad in-class experiences where the people in the room would have been more uh, engaged had they been online and uh, situations where I never could have had the same emotional reaction to what was happening in the room if I had been on Adobe Connect. So there are pros and cons in every direction. And when it is necessary and practical, an online solution definitely, in my opinion, makes sense and, and it should exist. But I will cry the day that Princeton Public closes its doors uh, due to practicality because the, there is something to the experience there that can be recreated in other libraries that uh, is necessary for the, for the heart and culture of a community if it's done correctly. If it's not done correctly, they're not missing anything by closing those doors. But when it is done correctly, it makes sense to not have it be happening through a 4 by 3 screen, in my opinion. And, and we should have a longer discussion about this because this is a rich topic that um, I think is very interesting. And, and I'm really interested to hear your views because most of the people who I talk to reflect <laughs> with the, the way that I feel. And to hear your opposing view uh, respectfully is is refreshing, you know. Well, I, I'm I'm glad that you uh, you know I, you're you're somebody who uh, I would never expect to stonewall me for having an opposing view. Uh, oh, really? So I, I appreciate that first off. Uh, but at the same time, I think I'm I'm tugging on certain heartstrings of yours in the sense that you are an embracer of technological change when it comes to education. And, you know, I, I can talk to you too as a, as a, a college, an adjunct college professor who's taught online classes and in, in person classes. There are certain classes, I mean, there's a class I'm teaching right now that I feel should be, I should be doing it online. And I should have the option to tell my class, guys, we're, we're not meeting anymore. We're going to just do this online. But I don't have that option. Uh, and so, you know, I, again, I, you know, I, I see both sides too when it comes to education, but when it comes to the library, uh, like I said, it's prolonging the inevitable uh, and I don't, I don't foresee a future, you know, I think, I think you and I unfortunately come from environments that are not the norm when it comes to libraries and I think we need to remember that. I, I'm, I come from Toms River, New Jersey. Uh, Ocean County Library in Toms River is probably one of the premier, probably second only to Princeton. I agree with you. That is a beautiful, beautiful library. I have friends there, and uh, any chance I have to visit there, it is, it's a joy. It is a legitimate joy. Tom's and I, you know, I'll say, growing up as a child in Tom's River, who were, where at the time, Tom's River was a very rural area, was still still converting from primarily farmers you know, to suburbia when I was a, a young child. 
the library was a very formative part of my youth. Uh, but then we're talking about the library of days gone by that, that does not exist today. Uh, but like I said, we, you and I grew up in areas where the, the library examples that we know are not the norm. And I think when, if we can remove ourselves from those areas and look at what's going on in the rest of the state, the rest of the country, where sacri major sacrifices and cuts are being made to library programs, the, these library directors or, or whatever you want to call them, the highest level librarians, should be looking at this, these ideas that I'm speaking about and embracing them as a way to save their institutions. I, I can only say that they are definitely aware of it. I mean, the directors that I'm talking about, where they have the infrastructure and where they have up-to-date libraries to, to any degree, any contemporary degree, they are looking at that as the horizon, as the next horizon. But they are not seeing uh, your vision of the library itself going away and being replaced completely virtu with, with virtuality. Uh, it may be the case. It, it may, in fact, be the case. Uh, but even I, in my liberal <laughs> sort of agreement that digitization is the way to go, don't don't see. I I just see it becoming more and more and more focused about people sitting and talking to each other, which I guess could happen outside of the library. But there's something about that uh, common experience if if it's a beautiful experience then people will come and the minute it's not if it's if it is uh, we both know about the difference between a beautiful space to do your work and a not so beautiful space to do your work yes right? we do yes we do so uh, which would you prefer always a beautiful space I mean you and I are blessed to you work in a a wonderful example of a new beautiful space and I work in a wonderful example of an old gothic beautiful space. Right, and, and I'll visit both of them as often as I can. I, I was in I was in your uh, building today and every time I'm in there I'm I'm sort of uh, taking in the the sight of that beautiful stone face and and thinking about who came before and just it, it really affects the way that you treat that space while you're in it. You know, there's a certain reverence and respect for education and for learning and for community because of the space itself. So uh, I think we'll probably talk about that again because that, that was nice, that was rich. Absolutely, would love to. So, uh, but we also want to talk tonight uh, as our last topic about organizations supporting platforms only embraced by their customers and not by the organization itself. And uh, I believe we were talking about technology specifically, but um, this can probably be applied in a lot of different ways. You want to start us off? Yeah, so you and I work for an organization that bills itself as the term I like to use, platform agnostic. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, but that's not, that. in reality, that's not the case. Not at all. Uh, just, and just like the previous institution we worked at, also billed itself as platform agnostic. And they kept, and the, our previous institution wanted to keep that mirage up so Badly, if you remember, our leader had on her desk a Windows machine and a Mac machine so that visitors to her office would not be offended at what was on her desk, which was one I, of I'm the sure most... Point, I'm sure at some point, you know, she just got a Mac and put Windows on one side of it and, and you know, solved that problem. <laughs> I'm sure she did. Um... But you know, going. But our current institution, like I said, they build themselves as platform agnostic. But if you look at the resources that are dedicated to the two platforms, uh, you will you will, it'll, it'll be abundantly clear that that Princeton is a Windows university, is a Microsoft university. It's a Microsoft shop for sure. sure. And I learned an interesting statistic today, and I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you the same question. Okay. If you could guess a percentage of Mac to PC users uh, from a f from the campus as a whole, no, or, hold on, I got, I'm getting my statistic wrong. From faculty, I'm sorry, faculty and staff, students aside, separate. So, if you were to guess PC to Mac split for faculty and staff as one group, what what is the split? You're talking about faculty only. No, faculty and staff together. 
in okay. one pool. So everybody that's not a student on campus, what is the split of PC and Mac? You're not going to give me a specific department to talk about? No, I'm asking you the campus as a whole. Okay. okay. I will say 80% Mac. You are correct. I thought that I might be. The statistic I was told today was between 70 and 80% Mac and then 20 and 30% PC. And students... The students is a whole. It's a whole. It's it's probably similar. It's probably very oh, close to that. Student, students is higher. Very okay. So the the last time I heard was about two or three years ago. It was uh, seventy thirty. So if if it's higher, I believe it for sure. I I advise you to go into Makash on a weekday in the oh, morning. Yeah. Go into fifty, and look up at the uh, class while it's going on. Because that's about 400 students, give or take. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see how many apples are shining. Yeah, OK. okay. I, be I, you know, I believe it. So, so here you go. So here you go. We're, you've just given, we've just given two concrete statistical examples of how dominant the Mac platform is at Princeton. Uh, and I can, I can say the same thing at Ryder. I'd say 80% of my students, whether they're using Windows or Mac on that Mac and Tosh, they have a, they have an Apple they have Apple hardware. Yeah. Uh, so I, here we go. We got. By the way, we we should preface this by saying, I don't have anything to prove that this is this is rumor from trusted sources that uh, these numbers are correct. Right? right. These are not official published numbers. These are just this is all hearsay uh, statistics. Right. You know, and this is just our perception as people on the front lines. So if somebody has other information, we welcome it and we'd love to hear it. We, we always want to be correct. We, we certainly don't want to misrepresent the university. For sure. Um, so here we go. Like I said, our, our former institution and our current, we have two environments where um, the Mac platform is obviously in the forefront of its users' uh, hearts, yet you and I still view both of those organizations as, as Microsoft shops. They are Microsoft shops, for sure. So this is a, a perfect example of an organization supporting platforms, uh, not, not supporting platforms that are embraced by their customers. Well, I mean, and th there is certainly support, right? If, if a faculty member of yours comes to you with a Mac-specific need, you're going to support that need, and, and your boss makes sure that you are able to meet that need, yeah? For sure, but when it comes to the greater good of the university, uh, that's a different story. If, you know, I need tier tier two or tier three support on a PC, I know that I'm going to get about 20 responses. Uh, whereas if I need tier two or tier three on a Mac, I'm probably only going to get two or three responses if I'm lucky. I, my experience in terms of support has been different. If, if I have a Mac-based need, it seems like there are plenty of people who are willing to uh, support that need, especially if we call our amazing and wonderful help desk. However, the technologies that are supported officially are mostly Microsoft-centric, right? If, if we want to arrange a calendar meeting between you and I, who both happen to be staff members, uh, we will be using Exchange. In my particular case, it's usually OWA, uh, Outlook web app because um, while Outlook is available for the Mac, it's not as convenient necessarily. It, I mean, the, the presence is there, but the server technologies and the background technologies are mostly Microsoft-centric, and sometimes that can cause issues because uh, as anybody who has ever been on a Mac who wants to use Microsoft software and um, also happens to be familiar with the Windows side experience of that same software, they're going to have a different experience. Um, it's not going to be as rich, it's not going to be as robust, and it's probably going to look a lot different. And so, you know, and the other thing is, you know, I just I just asked you to go into Makash, look up at, at the number of apples facing you. Chances are half of those apples are running Windows. I mean, it's it's very possible because of the platform. Right. We don't know. But we do know for sure that uh, there are not a lot of Mac 
servers running comparative to Windows-based services running. They may be Exchange services, for example, running on Mac hardware, uh, but I doubt it. No, that doesn't exist. And it wouldn't matter anyway because from our perspective, the service is the thing, right? No. Right, but I think you make a good point about Mac server because... There are there are certain uh, feature sets that are uh, offered on the Mac server platform that would greatly benefit a Mac user, an OS X user, and like you said, there's no. I would I, there's Mac servers are in the minority in the world, and you know that's a shame because that's partially Apple's fault, in the sense that they have have dumbed down their server platform within the last four years exponentially. You mean, and, for example, if I want to run a file server on my machine, it's essentially a two-click operation? No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is is that the older versions of Mac server offered ser a system administrators more functionality that they could offer to their users. Uh, and mm -hmm. it was easy to set up and configure those and now, with the newer versions of, of Mac Server, 10.7, 10.8 specifically, a lot of those features are disappearing. Hmm. And so if you were to take the most current version and compare it to 10.6, you would notice that a lot of the features that, you know, people have relied upon over the years, uh, you know, because Server 10.1 all the way to 10.6, the, the feature set grew each with each release. And since 10.6 to 10.8, the, fe the feature set has shrank. And that's 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 in my opinion that's 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 horrible. And therefore, if if you can't offer, even when ten six was around, there was no, there was nobody really offering the full gamut of services that OS X server could offer. Uh, and so Mac users were shortchanged because so, they were not able to tap into the functionality that would benefit them. Let's talk about a specific example of a service that disappeared from the later versions of the Mac server, so that we can talk about. Um, how that might be solved. And also, I want to hear what you would prefer in terms of customer service from an organization like Princeton if they recognized that their user base is maybe more interested in a different platform from on high than what they're getting now. Okay. Well, I'm going to need you to remind me about that last topic. But <laughs> to, to talk about that future, the, the feature missing. So, for example, um, and this may be this may be a little bit too technical of a conversation. And if you feel it is, let me know. Not at all. Let's let's take it away. What is the what is the what is the backbone? What is the when you look at systems and by systems I mean servers that serve communities, users, customers, whatever. What is what is the backbone configuration for 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 those type of systems? You would probably have Apache as the backbone. Lamp. Lamp. Lamp is what I'm getting at. Right. For Linux, those of you that don't know, it stands for Linux, PHP. Apache, MySQL, PHP. PHP, Perl, or Python. Yes. So Mac server has always historically offered, obviously, the Linux. Not, not, it was Unix. Yeah. Hardcore Unix with Apache, MySQL, and in the Mac's case, PHP only. Right. So with a Mac server, you could develop web applications. Uh, Mac, Apple themselves had their own web web stuff. You could deploy wikis, blogs, user websites. Uh, the list goes on and on. And all those those server uh, service offerings were built upon the Apache, MySQL, PHP backbones. In the newest version of server, uh, starting with 10.7, my MySQL gone. No more. And replaced with uh, post GRE SQL. Right. I don't know how that's pronounced, but that's what it is. WordPress. Okay. So I don't know about you, but I know that WordPress does not run on that database platform. So is, do you do you know the story behind that? Uh, my understanding is that there that MySQL was purchased by Oracle. They and were. People and people are, are getting nervous that Oracle is not going to maintain MySQL as the free platform that ha existed prior to its purchase. Right. MySQL was a thorn in the side of Oracle because it was an enterprise-level 
database solution that was impinging for free on Oracle's uh, robust database solution. And so they said, well, uh, let's buy that pain of an ass, a pain in the ass, and uh, kill it. And they haven't killed it yet because there are plenty of applications that still use it and they want to give people an opportunity to move away or to adopt a, a Oracle if they prefer, but they're certainly not interested in maintaining and developing it, really. And what has happened is there have been four forks, essentially, of MySQL, and uh, there, that forking has caused some consternation in the community. Meanwhile, WordPress still requires <laughs> uh, MySQL. So, I, well, I mean, you can get it to, to work with Postgres, but most people are not familiar with that application, with, the, with that da uh, database server. And so adapting it to, if you go into the configuration file, for example, for uh, the WordPress config file, you can specify that you prefer to connect to a different server type. Um, but most people nowadays, if they install WordPress, are doing it through a one-click install. Right. Because WordPress does that beautifully. But you usually have to at least set up a database to be expecting that request. And it may be on a different port, for example, than MySQL is. And it may uh, have to be connected to in a different way, which requires a change in the config file. And many people today, part of the success of WordPress has been its ease of setup. Um, so it causes uh, ripples. But uh, that is to say that it makes sense that uh, Apple doesn't want to bother with that because an end user or an administrative user like you or I who wants to set that up can set up a LAMP stack, an AMP stack on, on a Mac server without much more effort and have our own uh, custom solution in place. You know, and, and if you are interested in this and you don't even have to have a Mac server, if you have a Mac OS X machine and you want to learn about the technologies we're talking about, uh, there are many providers. One is Apache Friends, which uh, I believe now also distributes MAMP, M-A-M-P. And you, uh, you can probably go to MAMP.com and go and get it and install it. And uh, if you wanted to install your own WordPress installation on your desktop in front of you, you could go get uh, Apache Friends XAMP or MAMP and be able to install those services aside from the file services and other services that are offered in Mac OS X or Mac OS X server. So it, it's not as though Mac OS X's server solution is necessarily degraded because of the lack of that software. It's because of the politics involved that they're probably shying away from it. Sure, but here, if you think about it for a second, with Apple deciding to remove MySQL and switch to Postgres, this is a microcosm example of our topic in the sense that <laughs> Postgres has been around for a long time, I understand. I think since the 90s, if I'm correct. It's been around for all, roughly the same amount of time as MySQL. Okay. And if we were to poll developers, I would say probably 80 to 90% of them are still using MySQL. And I'm sure that I'm sure those numbers change each year now, with the politics that more and more people become aware of those politics. So if my numbers are wrong, maybe it's 70, 70 30, 60, 40. Uh, but my point is, is that a majority of developers are still using MySQL, right? Can uh, we agree on that? I I cannot agree because I don't know the numbers. That your numbers sound a little high. Okay. I think there are a lot of developers using Oracle. A lot of developers using uh, Microsoft SQL Server and some developers using MySQL. It really depends on whether or not they're buying into the rest of the platform of LAMP, for example. Okay. So, but we'll just say, though, if I'm, if I'm a previous customer of OSX Server, I'm probably someone who uses MySQL. I would agree with that. Okay, so let's go on. Let's base our discussion on that. Okay. So if I'm used to using MySQL and I've used it for the past, uh, I guess, let's see, OS X has been around since, what, 2001? So the past 10... 10 to 11 years, yeah. and then one day Apple says, we're not going to do that anymore. Isn't that an example of an organization supporting a plat and not supporting a platform that's embraced by their customers? Well, I yes, I would, I would agree with that, 
However, that is very often Apple's MO. I mean, what, what, no, I'm serious. Yeah, it I mean, is. How often, how often has Apple just walked away from a technology because they got uh, enamored with another technology that they felt served their needs better? And by their needs, I mean their needs, not necessarily their customers' needs. Uh, technology does introduce change, but very often Apple introduces unnecessary change. I think the the um, adapter issue, the changing the uh, power adapter, the, the Google Maps, Google Maps, the, you know, perfect it, it, example. It makes sense in the long term. It does not make sense in the short term, and it's because they have a captive audience that they can get away with things like that. They they essentially have a dedicated fan base that is willing to put up with nonsense because they get all the other benefits of participating. They, they, they're willing to put up with that nonsense because there's a lot of non-nonsense in the rest of the platform, right? The iOS users cannot be convinced otherwise, and um, I, as an Android user, can't be convinced otherwise. Despite the fact that the iPhone is a beautiful device and there are many great things about it, I'm just not going to use it because I'm dedicated to the platform. If Android all of a sudden had a maps problem is unlikely because they have a world-class map solution, but uh, let's say that messaging all of a sudden was, there was a new development in messaging and Google decided not to adopt it or to uh, make their own Twitter and not allow the Twitter app to be you know, installed or some, some nonsense like that. I can give a specific example that would match the map solution specifically. Okay. So Windows Phone platform, the, the relaunched version of uh, Windows Phone, which we know launched about two or three years ago, used to use Bing Maps. Yeah. Bing Maps has, is a, say what you want about the Bing service, Bing Maps has always been a well-respected mapping solution, probably second only, very close second to Google Maps. I'm, I'm actually jealous of Bing Maps. I mean, the only reason why I don't use it is because I'm dedicated to Google. But um, Bing, Bing Maps is a fantastic service. Okay, so here we'll say maybe even better than Google Maps. So I, I don't know if I can let those words escape my teeth, but uh, okay. I'll say them for you. Oh, thanks. So you Bing Maps. Let's Google. say Bing. Let's say Microsoft decided that, or let's say Microsoft had a change in the contract for those maps. Maybe Microsoft is purchasing those maps from someone else. Maybe they're making them themselves. Let's say for the sake of this conversation, it's a purchase, and the contract with the, the, that provider is up, and they have to replace Bing Maps with TomTom Tom Maps. Okay. Now, with the, uh, the, the, the struggles with the adoption of the Windows Phone platform, if Microsoft is saying, hey, we're, we're getting rid of our premier maps, one of our major strategic advantages, and switching to TomTom Tom Maps, which is the same map set that Apple is now using for Apple Maps, that would probably be the death knell or very close to a death knell for the Windows Phone platform because, like you said, you don't have that rabid customer base that's unshakable like you do for iOS and Android. Not yet, certainly. No. Yeah. I, I agree with you. If, if they were to do something like that, it would be very difficult to consider because that's one of their wins. You know, it's one of the reasons why people who use... Uh, Windows Phone would use Windows Phone. Uh, I don't even know. I've never looked for it because it would hurt my fingers to tap on the screen and look for it. But uh, is there a Bing Maps solution for Android? Yeah, there's a Bing. I'm almost positive there's a Bing app for, for Android. I know there is for iOS because Tim Cook just told the entire Apple customer base if they weren't happy with Apple Maps to download the Bing app. Wow. <laughs> That's disgusting. I, I need to go vomit. Would you excuse me, please? <laughs> that was the best thing I've ever heard in my life, actually. Steve yeah. Jobs would have would have would have died rather than say those words. So that's a huge difference between uh, Jobs and Cook for sure. I think I think actually that's what happened. It wasn't in the autobiography or in the biography, <laughs> but actually it was a conversation between Tim Cook he saw he saw Steve Jobs at a really weak moment, and he was like, "Bing Maps on iPhone." And he was like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome!" <laughs> so now we know Steve, Tim Cook murdered Steve Jobs with Bing Maps. Right. 
it's like Colonel Mustard in the library with the Bing Steve Maps. Jobs, uh, Tim Cook in the solarium with Bing Maps. <laughs> oh man. So, but you know, it's funny. I would have. I didn't. I'm. I think there's a larger topic here that we could talk about another time, and that is organizations like Apple, who make these arbitrary decisions that negatively impact their loyal customers. And I think that's that's a wonderful topic. Maybe for not for next week, but the week after. Uh, so I'll be making a note of that. I think. I think there's a lot of. A lot of interesting things we can we can cite as specific examples uh, with with Apple and maybe even other organizations uh, that that you know because th there's been a lot of really bad business decisions made that negatively impact customers that adopt platforms. I, you know this is a this is a, an old example, but early adopter of uh, HD DVD right here. Yeah, like I had a whole catalog catalog of movies in HD DVD. And then, boom, it was over. You know what I mean? Just like that, overnight. I, I And my HD DVD was worthless. You know, that's a, that's another area where the customer was not uh, was not served in any way when that happened. So, I think we got a lot of we got we we should we, we should revisit this topic in a different and take it from a different angle as opposed to the angle we took it tonight. I agree. Um, but it's uh, almost ten thirty, and yeah, I wanted to say epic show tonight. Thank you so much for your input on it. And um, I had a really fun time as always talking with you about important topics. I'm looking forward to next week. As am I. And uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully hearing from our new uh, podcast listeners as well. Yeah. Uh, is there an opportunity for, I actually have not visited the site. Is, is there an opportunity for uh, feedback? Is it a WordPress site or what is it? It's actually, if we want to just talk about what we're using for a second, uh, we're it's actually a subsite of my main website, so it's actually its own independent uh, uh, lamp, lamp configuration. If you if, as to, to 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 talk about that, so we were able to, we were able to use whatever platform necessary to make uh, our podcast publishing possible. Uh, and after exploring the different options available in WordPress, I found them to be uh, very complicated not easy to set up, and also not easy to integrate into my existing blogging uh, structure. So I did some exploration, and I found that there's an open source solution called Podcast Generator built upon PHP. doesn't even need MySQL, uh, and it'll run on anything that has PHP. Um, so that's you can run it on IIS, you know, Apache, and the list goes on and on. And it, it basically... Um, Looks very similar to a WordPress site, but it, it handles all the connections necessary and all the feeds necessary to interface with Apple for iTunes public publishing, Microsoft on the Zune Marketplace, and also generates uh, a W3C standard feed that's compatible with what standard podcast catchers, as you call them. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, the, the open source technology is called Podcast Generator, uh, and it's available on SourceForge. It's a, I think it's an excellent... Very easy to set up, very easy to configure platform, uh, and uh, I strongly recommend those of you that are looking to get into podcasting to check out Podcast Generator. Fantastic. And thank you again, Sean. That was an amazing amount of work that you put into that. No problem. It was my pleasure. We should, um, we should talk offline about uh, possibly having either a Facebook page or some other way to – is it because I'm – Hearing that this is very specifically for podcasts, I'm wondering where we can get conversations going. And it seems like we already have a strong presence on Facebook as individuals, but maybe we could have a, a tertiary presence where we could um, have show notes and, and other materials and advertise our latest content. So, yeah, let's let's well, we will have that conversation. Good, All yeah, right. let's do that. Maybe over lunch. Yeah, that's a great idea. All right, sounds good to me. All right, thanks so much, man. Thank you. Good night. Talk to you.